this time is really your time. So if there's any particular plants we pass by that you want, want to ask questions about, just ask questions. Um, nobody, probably, most people don't like to be out in the sun in the hot weather, but I think in the summertime, it's the sun garden that it is a real standout. The shade garden is pretty. It's per primarily beautiful foliage this time of year. Not that many things blooming in the shade garden. Certainly winter and early spring is the peak of bloom in the shade garden, though there's quite a few things that bloom in late summer and uh, fall. But I um, thought we'd start out in the sun, if that's okay with you. Sounds good. Okay, I well, thought we'd start over this way. This plant has the common name of chocolate flower, and if you smell the flowers, I think you'll get a, a you'll smell chocolate. It's um, the genus is Berlandiera. Like so many plant names, it's named after somebody, somebody with the family name of Berlandiera. It's native to the southwest U.S. and, and Texas, uh, I mean uh, Mexico, and it, it blooms pretty much all summer. Um, if it turns really dry, it might slow down a bit, but it's, it's really a long season bloomer. Um, if you're from a colder climate, there's not that many salvias you can grow, but in our climate, um, there are so many different salvias that are winter hardy. Salvia farinacea is native to uh, Texas and other parts of the Southwest, um, and it's reliably winter hardy. The one that, I don't know if Victoria is uh, still readily available in the annual trade, but that's the only one I've ever encountered that's um, not winter hardy, but all, all the other selections of Salvia farinacea um, are winter hardy, and they will bloom from May up until frost. Some years, if they get shabby by midsummer, you can cut them to the ground and they'll quickly be back into new growth and bloom up until fall. You can see the bumblebees really like the flowers. Um, so it's a peak time for uh, providing flowers for pollinators. Um, this side, we have not an exceptional example of another type of salvia. Um, these shrubby ones that are generally have the name of autumn sage. In a real dry climate, they slow down bloom in um, summertime, which this seems to be doing. But um, it's been in bloom since May and it'll go up until frost. And they are shrubs, um, full sun, extremely drought tolerant. Um, late winter, we clean them up by cutting them back by a third to a half because they don't shed all, uh, all their flower stalks. And in late winter, we can clean them up that way. I'm going to take a few steps up. Yes. Salvia, when winter comes, do the, does the growth die back and it comes back from the roots? Yeah, it's, it, it's herbaceous, so it completely disappears in the okay. winter. Um, so w once you've had a frost, you can cut it to the ground. Uh, this type of salvia, they, they are truly shrubs, so those are woody stems that live from year to year. Yeah. I lost a lot of uh, lantanas okay. this year, because it got down to like 12 or 13. Right. Uh, obviously, these guys did well. Did you yeah. lose much over the winter? Because uh, it was unusually cold this year. Um, well, it wasn't unusually cold. It was unusually cold only from the standpoint of like the last ten years. It was still very much within the normal range for okay. Zone Seven B. It actually still wasn't. It was really a cold Zone Eight winter. Um, and I, I should say that one of the um, w the big focus of Plant Delights Nursery and Juniper Level Botanic Garden has always been trying things that we haven't been grown before. Right. So when we do have, we, we're actually very thankful when we have a cold winter because that's when we finally determine whether or not something is winter hardy in okay. this area. And in, in these particular gardens, there are a lot of uh, cactus that died this winter when we went to, what did we go down to? I think like 14 or 12 or something yeah. like that. So something that dies at 14 or 12 degrees is not a zone seven plant. It, that's hardly even a zone eight plant. Uh, the higher the number, the milder the winter. Um, so um, going back to your question about lantanas, most lantanas are not winter hardy. You go in a garden center still this time of year, there's all these gorgeous lantanas that are superb as summer annuals, but don't expect most of them to survive the winter. 
Uh, we sell, I don't know, five or six or more different selections that have been have proven hardy over the years um, in zone seven. But the run of the mill Lantana is not going to be winter hardy for us. I'm going to take a few steps up this way. So many really superb alliums available now. Uh, which one is this one? I'm really good at reading labels. This is Pink, Pink Planet. Um, so that was pink what? Planet, pink planet, like the planet Earth. Um, the uh, alliums that are, uh, grow from bulbs and are planted in the fall have long since finished blooming, but these ones don't grow from bulbs. They're, you know, have a root system much like a, you know, daylily or something like that. Um, and they, they're just in peak bloom in midsummer. You can see a bunch of great big carpenter bees on it. They're highly favored by pollinators. They're really low maintenance. When they're done blooming, you, you know, you just snap the old dispensed seed stalks off. Millennium is another common selection that's really superb. Um, they're full sun plants. those available in, in the cell house. Okay. Yeah. Is Millennium going to, is it going to rot in moisture soil? Does it need? Um, that's a good question because this gives the impression that they have to have sharp drainage. They don't, just average drainage. Okay. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't want a soggy site, but just, you know, the same uh, soil that you could grow a peony or a, a daylily or something like that would be adequate. doesn't need sharp drainage. The genus Allium is really big and there are some rare species that need sharp drainage, but not these common ones. They're really almost foolproof. Um, red hot pokers are highlight of the uh, late spring and summer garden. This is a big species, Ruperi. Um, I don't know what else to say about them. Um, Four o'clocks are just finishing up. They open up in the evening, very fragrant. A lot of people don't realize they're winter hardy in this area. They grow from a really big tuberous root. Um, they do make lots of seedlings, so some people might find them weedy. Okay. What about this desert melon here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is, um, I know it by the common name of buffalo gourd. Um, it's night blooming on this cloudy morning. I think it's night blooming. I don't know. The, I might be wrong on that. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, it's actually a uh, perennial. It's a winter hardy perennial. Most members of the cucurbit family are annuals. You've probably grown zucchini or pumpkins or melons from seed and you know they, they they're dead before the end of the summer, but this comes back from a tuberous root every spring. Um, it's native to the southwest U.S. I'm seeing if there's a fruit on it. So I'm, yeah, you should feel the leaves. Yeah. They're very, very sandpapery. Sandpaper. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. They're and bitter, it's um, bitter, right? Or... Well, um, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, it's Curcurbita fetidissima, fetidissima meaning very fetid, very stinky. And the, you know, I can I can smell the foliage just uh, you know standing next to it. We are celebrating agaves all throughout this open house, and you know we have this very nice specimen of an agave there, and they're really a plant for year-round interest. Those really beautiful, bold architectural form. Um, Maybe I should find this one's label. Hopefully this will be it. Yeah, this is a, a hybrid Proto-Americana and the cultivar is Funky Toes. I, I like the really scalloped edge to the leaf. It's one that's winter hardy here. Um, yes, sir. How many man hours do you think it takes to maintain this place? Deweeding of the beds and just keeping it up? Well, I'm one of the people doing a lot of that work. Uh, I have, oh, uh, about <coughs> four to five full-time people working with me and another four to five part-time people. And we, do, we just barely, we don't really keep up with it. We almost keep up with it. Almost keep
Daylilies, it's, we're sort of going past the peak of the daylily season, though there are some late cultivars that, um, that are just starting. I might offer you a little tip on daylilies. Their natural life growth habit or life cycle is the foliage they put up in the spring is now quite shabby, which is why I don't like short daylilies because because you're forced to look at the flowers on top of the foliage that is now tired. But by the time they're done blooming, and this one's not showing it very much, but they start to put up new growth. So you could go in when this is done blooming and cut each flower stalk off and then clean up the foliage. Or when they're done blooming, you can cut the whole thing down to, you know, a few inches. And then you'll get rid of all this old foliage, which is just going to continue to get shabbier and shabbier over the course of this um, growing season. And you get rid of all of this, which was beautiful in April. And then the new foliage will replace all that, and that foliage will be clean all the rest of the growing season, which is a much nicer effect in the garden than the shabby foliage. Most people, you know, are shocked when we tell them that. I've been doing it for years. The person who um, told me to do it years ago was running a had a uh, daylily nursery at that time, so I think he probably knew what he was talking about. Did we answer your questions on the uh, yeah, yeah. buffalo gourd? Yeah. Uh, oh, in other parts of the garden, you'll see other examples of uh, spider lilies. Of course, we'll see other spider lilies that are distant cousins of this, but um, you know that, that's the problem with common names. Um, but these are the spider lilies that are in the genus Hymenocallus. And Hymenocallus means beautiful membrane, and you can see where it gets that. We have the six tepals or petals, and in between it you have this beautiful membrane. But um, it's a fairly large genus. Some of them are wet site plants. The Cahaba lily of southern rocky rivers will only grows in swiftly flowing uh, rivers and you know amongst the rocks in these shallow rocky rivers others are desert plants so uh, um, but really worthwhile many of them like like this one have really nice um, green foliage which is uh, you know pleasant to look at even when it's not in bloom many of them are very fragrant too there's big stands of tropical uh, giant in bloom down in the um, sun garden that are really beautiful this time of year. Are there any with variegated foliage? foliage? There's at least one with variegated foliage that's fairly common in the um, aquarium trade. Okay. Yeah. Um, there might be others, but I'm not aware of uh, uh, others. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, if you go through the rest of the garden, you'll see many other examples of crinums, often called crinum lilies. They're more closely related to amaryllis than to the true lilies. They have that same growth habit of an amaryllis with basal, strap-like foliage, and then a, a naked flower stalk with the big flowers. Um, many, most of the crinums that are grown in gardens are man-made hybrids. Uh, Summer is the peak of their bloom. Um, some are done blooming already, but most are summer blooming, and a lot of them will bloom repeatedly, especially as they get, uh, the longer they've been established, some will bloom more frequently than when they're first planted. Some are fragrant. I don't think this guy's fragrant at all. Um, summer is also a good time for these subtropical plants that manage to survive our winter like uh, cannas. That's one called Australia. Many of the cannas are um, really worthwhile to grow with just for their colorful foliage. What's caught your attention there? Cyrus? Um, yeah. Is it an iris? Well, depending on how up to date your taxonomy is. <laughs> this is... Um, if you know blackberry lily, which was not a lily, but used to be pardon thopsis, no, pardon canda, and now has been re lumped with the iris. But this is a hybrid between um, 
the blackberry lily and the vesper iris, they both look very similar. They have this uh, similar flower form, but the vesper iris, um, as you might guess from that common name, doesn't bloom until the evening, the, you know, the time for vesper prayers. Um, so when you cross Pardon Canda and no, when you cross Bellum Canda and Pardon Thopsis, you come up with the hybrid Pardon Thopsis. I think I might have gotten it straight. Um, and they're blooming this time of year for an extended period of time. I don't know if this is a named clone. When you cross them, you get a whole range of colors. Um, and, you know, s some of them get uh, named and propagated asexually to keep them true. You can see here's a true lily and you see how different the growth habit is compared to the crinum. This, the true lilies have leaves in, all around the stem with the flowers at the, term, uh, at the top of the stem. See this, this day, day lily is ready to be cut back and you can see, um, you see this beautiful new foliage in here? Oh yeah. Yeah, so you know, do you want me to, when, when I've t taught renewal pruning classes, there's some shrubs like the beauty berries that we often cut to the ground in late winter. And it, somebody always asks, do you mean to the ground? And so I'll go out and cut one to the ground to see that that's what I mean. It looks pretty dreadful today. A week from now, all this new growth that's will uh, you know, like cover. It's exactly like cutting back liriope. Um, and oh, sure, set the lawnmower high enough. Even if you cut this new foliage, it continues to grow through the summer months. So um, you know, initially they'll have cut tips, but it'll quickly look fresh the rest of the summer. And all this old stuff's just going to get worse all summer. What Friday, Canna. Is that I'm squinting, but I can't read the song. Canna, um, pink sunburst. It's it's a lot like um, Faison, but Faison has a orange flower, and this has a pink flower. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, interesting. There are not that many double-flowered lilies, but this is the double-flowered form of the tiger lily, which is a wild species of lily, not a garden hybrid. Um, you know, years ago, the tiger lily was Lilium tig tigrinum, referring to tigers, but now it's Lilium lancifolium. And butterflies like uh, these lilies. Oh, and butterfly bushes, great for summer bloom. Um, when we have the time, we'll go through and, and deadhead them because they don't clean themselves. Um, and they just, they, they'll continue to bloom even if you don't deadhead them, but um, they look more presentable if you cut the spent blooms off. They're, you know, just be, cut them down to the next um, non-blooming shoot. There's probably flower buds in there already. Have you guys trialed um, the Lissimachia Outback? I don't know that one. It's got almost variegated, I guess. Yeah. Is it burgundy with a variegation? No, it's orange and yellow and green. Oh, sounds lovely. Really bright. Yeah, sounds lovely. Yeah, th this is, per I believe, Persian chocolate. There's its label. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great little ground cover. Mm. Summertime is a peak time for the carnivorous plants. Um, now this is an assortment of maybe mostly hybrid pitcher plants, saracenias. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely full sun plants. They don't do terribly well unless they have full sun. On oh, a pineapple lily, Eucomus, um, they do often flop, which is unfortunate, but the, as cut flowers, they last for a long time. They're, they grow from a big bulb, like an amaryllis bulb, and um, they're in bloom for a couple months in the summertime, fully winter hardy in the ground. 
I had some in a pot and they died this winter in a pot, but they would have been fully winter hardy in the ground. Do you find the bogs um, are prone to get pretty weedy? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, we probably weeding the bogs once a week or so. And, and some of them, um, some of my coworkers are attempting to get bog plants that would act as a ground cover, like um, sphagnum moss and other native bog plants that would sort of provide a matrix between the uh, pitcher plants. I, um, you know, I think whenever you have bare spots in the garden, something's going to grow. So, you know, like this ice plant is covering the ground and uh, helps to, um, you know, there's probably fewer weeds through a ground cover like that than there is in the blank spots in between. Of course, some ground covers like this agave aren't terribly fun to weed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Dirty blocks. Really. The mountain mints, um, pycnanthemums, they are in the mint family, but that's a huge family with, you know, thyme and lavender and the salvias and stuff. And this one doesn't smell particularly minty to me. Um, but m many of them are very mint scented. This one's mostly done blooming, but where there's still flowers, um, very, very uh, highly favored by pollinators. Um, the spent flower heads turn sort of charcoal gray and they're actually attractive all winter long. Um, this is Pycnanthemum tenuifolium, meaning narrow leaf. Um, some of the mountain mints do spread quickly this, the rate of spread of this one is moderate, but there are some like Pycnanthum and Lumisii that are clump former, um, which for a small garden is, is, is useful. The garden Phlox, Phlox paniculata, superb for months of bloom in the summer months. Um, nowadays, um, there are many selections that are, um, that are don't get powdery mildew in the summer. A lot of the older varieties did. Most nurseries nowadays, I think, sell ones that are have clean foliage through the summer months. Um, yes, the big plant back there with the bright yellow foliage yes. is our pokeweed. Uh, it's just a yellow-leafed selection of it. Um, and that's one plant that gets gigantic. We have to cut it back some to keep it off the sidewalk be, or the walkway behind it. Um, you can see it's flowering and developing some fruit but they haven't colored up yet. Lycoris are also called spider lilies. This uh, particular selection is not very spidery. Maybe we'll see one that has more of that sort of very narrow petal. And that's a really confusing planting because these are the spider lilies, the fo foliage it, through which it's growing is a fern, and then there's this canna. I wonder if the canna got there on its own from seed. But this, when the spider lilies bloom in summer and early, late summer and early fall, they don't have foliage. Um, uh, about half of them will put up foliage about the time they're done blooming and have that foliage through the winter months and but some of the species and hybrids don't put foliage up until spring even though they bloom this time of year. This is um, like course ex spring guineanum so it's um, it's a hybrid between uh, spring and um, sanguinea. Joe pieweed a superb native um, I think this is little red which is a you know quite small compared to the six to eight foot tall. Um, what's that? I think it's phantom. Phantom? Okay, thank you, Chris. Yeah, Eupatorium maculatum phantom, though nowadays they're in a new genus, I think, uh, Eurebia. But um, these flowers aren't open yet, but it's a great pollinator plant when it, when it blooms. Common 
back in. We met one allium earlier. This is a, a wild species allium native. It's a prairie plant and it's um, allium um, nutans and nutans means nodding and you can see why it's it got that name. But it'll look very much like the pink planet when it's in bloom, though often a white to pale pink. Is that the largest yucca there is? Um, is it yucca traculiana? Yeah, it's yucca traculiana. Oh, a cultivar named Sasquatch. Um, there are a few species of yucca that are native to the eastern U.S., but most are native to the southwest and Mexico and I guess into Central America. But it's a big thing and uh, quite winter hardy. This is a, um, another, you know, most of the lilies in the garden are man-made hybrids, but this is a wild species. This is Lilium speciosum. Speciosum means very showy. And I think you probably wouldn't argue. Um, yeah, and butterflies love this flower. There's probably too many of us standing around scaring. Well, there's a little silver spotted crescent on, um, on that flower. It's also very fragrant. I think I'm getting some of its fragrance. Oh yeah, nice fragrance. Did we get pollen on your nose? Did I? Probably. <laughs> Is there a term for when the pet petals uh, go inward, like mm. backwards? R reflexed. reflexed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if we'll see um, other examples of it, but these two s spikes of pink tubular flowers, it's a syningia. Syningias are in the uh, African violet family. It's a large family, mostly tropical plants, but these syningias that are winter hardy are superb plants. They bloom all summer long. We've actually had to deadhead them recently because they, the huge flush they produced earlier was done already, but they continued to bloom all summer. I think this pink one, well, there's its label. Let's see. Oh, this is Caroline. There's two that are similar, similar um, but, and they make a huge tuberous root. They're very, very drought tolerant, so they can go in a hot, sunny spot. And up above it, also in pink, is the begonia that has always been referred to as the hardy begonia, begonia grandis. Um, it is a plant that blooms in the summertime in the shade. And uh, nowadays, there's so many begonias that are proving to be winter hardy, so this is no longer the exception to the rule. Though, again, like this, uh, African violet family, most, it, the begonia family is large um, and most of them are tropical, but there's quite a few that have proven to be winter hardy nowadays. Um, and I think all of them are pretty much uh, shade plants. It's certainly time for the hibiscus. Uh, they don't have, they love a wet site. They don't have, a, have to have a wet site. I wouldn't plant them in a dry site, but just average moisture, they'll do fine. Um, they bloom, I don't know, six weeks or so, some of them longer. Um, these are winter hardy species that um, die to the ground in the winter, though this, we usually use the stalks standing until late winter because they're fairly attractive, especially the um, wild species that make a lot of seed pods on it that are, that are attractive. It, uh, again, it, it's sort of like the uh, African violet and um, begonia family, where probably the largest number of species of hibiscus are tropical trees and shrubs. Um, but the parents of these um, hybrids are all North American natives. Have you ever sort of topped them so they flush out a little more? Like in you the mean spring? after they, oh, what time of the year? In sp early spring, you know, kind of. Essentially pinching them back? Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, when they're young, there might be some advantage to that. Years ago, when I was working in another garden, we were growing a couple older varieties. The, uh, I, I refer to them as the Baltimore series. The cultivars were Lord Baltimore and Lady Baltimore and Anne Arundel. And they got eight, nine feet tall. And they weren't good about standing up on their own. 
they would flop out, but if you staked them, the stems soon hardened up and then they would stand the rest of the summer. But on those, they made so many stems that I would actually remove maybe at least half of them because they didn't need 30 stems to make a good display. If you stake like a dozen of them, they'd make a good display. So when they're young, you might want to do that to encourage more stems, but generally after they've been established a while, they have uh, an abundance of stems. Yeah, if, if you know those huge flowers are a little bit gaudy, this is one of the wild parents, not, not their main parent, but this is um, Hibiscus de la Deza Deza Calix, or I think that's the right name. Real narrow foliage. So, you know, that's a leaf. Just little trifoliate flowers. And this, this will make, th these seed pods that are forming now are pretty all winter long, so it's usually February, March when we finally cut it down. The Umble family, the family to which parsley and dill and fennel and carrots and belong are another really good one for um, pollinators. But the really important thing to remember about that family is that it also includes some um, very poisonous plants such as this water hemlock. Um, and here we have a um, eastern black swallowtail caterpillar because they the caterpillars eat just members of this family, the umble family. And this one has now reached maturity for a caterpillar and is sort of setting up to become a, a chrysalis and I guess in a few weeks become a butterfly. Um, but you know, if you've grown um, partially in your vegetable garden, you've probably ended up with that same caterpillar on them. But the water hemlock is, um, a native and we do allow a little bit of it in the garden. It's a beautiful architectural plant. And what parts of that are poisonous? I believe the entire plant is poisonous. Is it touching it? No, 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 you, no, not touching it, okay. um, ingesting it. I know I've read where, I don't know if it's this plant, but some of them have a tuberous root that looks like a parsnip and people scav scavenging for food sometimes think, oh, we found some parsnips and they end up poisoning themselves. So always know what, what the plant is before you eat it. Great big um, old plant that I love, Cryptocorony, Landtown Lady. Um, beautiful, beautiful foliage. Very stiff foliage, you feel it's like plastic. Blooms all summer. Um, you can see on the older flower stalks, it starts making these plantlets. So it ends up, you know, sort of taking over a lot of garden space and every year we need to remove a lot of it, but it sort of earns its keep otherwise. You cut it to the ground during the winter? It, it dies to the ground in the winter, yes. Um, and then we dig out the excess of it. But it wants a wet site. It'll grow in standing water. Yeah, another um, species, hibiscus. They have smaller flowers than the big hybrids, but they have their own beauty. Ah, oh, and it's time of year for cardinal flowers. Lobelia cardinalis. Um, both the birds and named cardinals, they're named after the cardinals in the Roman Catholic Church who wore red garments, and that's okay. how these came to be named cardinal flower and the bird uh, cardinal. Are they like a pretty wet? Um, yeah, th this is very wet. I don't don't see them growing in standing water, but certainly all the way down to the edge of the water. Um, they're fairly short-lived perennials that tend to uh, replace themselves quickly uh, by seeding. Probably find seedlings in the crack in the sidewalk. Well, not today. To a typical wild canna, and cannas with small flowers like that are highly favored by hummingbirds. But your question was on um, foliage getting shabby. Cannas are putting up new growth all through the warm months of the year. And the oldest stems that are done blooming um, 
the foliage gets starts to get shabby because it, it's just tired and I don't, I'm not familiar with the rust you referred to but this what I'm going to suggest and I'll see if I can get up here this is done blooming um, you know they, they put up the terminal flower stalk and once that's done it doesn't put out any additional flower stalks so just to keep the clumps presentable um, probably starting next month or so we'll go in and start cutting out any stalks that are done blooming that are tired looking um, and that might solve your problem I don't know um, Yes, and gingers are certainly a plant I like to talk about this time of year, and thankfully that one is in bloom. The, uh, these are ginger lilies, hedicium. Um, there's some that have already been blooming quite a bit. Most of them are sort of start this year or l this time of year or later, and then go on um, usually up until frost. Many are fragrant. Um, I love cannas. Uh, the ginger lilies are a little bit lower maintenance because um, they don't get the canna leaf roller. Um, they, um, Japanese beetles don't seem to like them. Uh, Japanese beetles, I think they're oh, we're over the worst of them, but these chewed edges here are from the Japanese beetles. Um, so, yeah, and all these chewed edges are Japanese beetles, but I'm not seeing any beetles today. But the, the is that like a culinary ginger? No, the um, the ginger lilies are in the same family as the culinary ginger and turmeric and galangal, um, but they're all different species, they're in different genera. Um, and the the culinary ginger is in the genus Zingerber, which you see it's they have the same you know root word. Um, and they, they're kind of odd because they bloom at ground level. They make these fairly sh tiny flower just at ground level. Yeah, um, they don't have these terminal spikes. And the um, hedicums that we grow are all winter hardy and the culinary ginger is generally not winter hardy in this area. Um, are they edible? I think they're edible in that they're not poisonous, but I don't, and they do have a bit of uh, fragrance. Um, there is um, Zingerber Miyoga, which is a, um, well, I, know, I know it's native to Japan, not, probably wider spread than that, where the inflorescence is eaten. And again, that's produced at ground level, but if you, it's a compact sort of version of that cone-like structure. Right. Um, that whole thing is uh, harvested and sliced thinly and eaten like in a um, garnish on I don't know, a salad or something. Um, cardamom is the same family too, and cardamom often overwinters. Let's see if I can get out of here gracefully. It says turmeric, this is curcuma. Um, really beautiful one, uh, curcuma longa. Um, and I don't know if this ever blooms, but certainly a gorgeous foliage plant. Um, and, and that lots of fencing. Would rabbits kind of think they're hostas and just eat them to the ground? The, I don't think so, because I, th I think they would, uh, they might have a bit of a odor. Yeah, there's, there's a bit of a fragrance to that. Okay. Oh, yeah. There was a baby rabbit in my fenced-in backyard last week, and what it ate were, were the salvias. And, you know, they shouldn't eat salvias if they read the book. You, you mentioned lantanas earlier. This right. is Chapel Hill Yellow, which is um, one of the more reliably winter hardy ones.